<clears throat> I think this is working okay now, guys, right? Okay, so I won't be able to tell. I don't have any monitor or anything up here to tell me if it's working. So if it's not working, I'm relying on you, Rob McIntosh, to go like this or something like that. So that means the pressure is on you. If Rob falls asleep and we get 30 minutes into this, and I don't know, we're starting over. We're going to be in Romans chapter 7 today. Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. We'll be reading out of the New American Standard Bible. Uh, yeah, we didn't do the first 13 verses, but we're going to cover those during our, our message this morning. We good to go? Okay. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do but I am doing the very thing I hate. Sound familiar? Ever felt that way with yourself to where you're like, man, I see what the Scripture says, but I'm not doing it. I don't know what I'm doing. Ever said, this is what I need to do, but this is not what I am doing. We're going to pick it up in verse 16. Verse 16 says, but if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Nothing good lives in me, which is my flesh. That is my flesh. I know that there's nothing good in me. It says, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. And I can check that off too, because that sounds like me too. I want to do it, but I'm not doing it. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil. I practice the evil things that I don't want to do, but I practice the very evil I do not want. Who's speaking here? Who's he referring to? This is one of those passages, and we'll get, continue on in just a second, but I want you to think about this. Some people, this is probably the most controversial section or part of the book of Romans as to who he's referring to. Because some will say, well, this is referring to Paul when he was a Jew, when he was persecuting Christians. Others will say, no, this is Paul when he was an immature Christian where he was struggling with right and wrong. And still others will say, no, this is Paul today. And in the first 13 verses, it's in a third person, but now it is in the singular where Paul is using the word over and over again, I. I. And we'll get into this in greater detail tonight, but I want you to understand right now that it, the majority of scholars believe with the third thing, that this is Paul as a mature Christian still struggling with sin in his life. And this is one of those passages to where it is probably the most dramatic testimony of Paul. In other places, he calls himself the chief of sinners or the chief of all sinners. But right here, he is basically saying very clearly, very succinctly, that what I want to do, I do not do. And what I do not want to do, I do that. So let's pick it back up. We're in verse... Let's pick it up in verse 20. It says, but if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer doing it. It's not me who's doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now look at this next part where it says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur or agree with the law of God in the inner man. But then look at this next part. He says, but I see a different law. I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Verse 24 says, wretched man that I am. Who then will set me free from the body of this death? Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. 
Some people say, well, this can't be Paul because Paul is perfect. Paul didn't have those type of struggles. We see over and over again in the text that Paul struggles with sin. But when we tend to think of Paul, we tend to think of Paul as this great evangelist in the first century who spread Christianity, who taught a gospel of grace, who taught so many wonderful things, but to look and say, man, it's saying the word I here. Yeah, Paul struggles with sin. Anybody here struggle with sin? Anybody here struggle with the fact that says, I don't want to do that sin, but the very next day or sometimes the next minute or hour, you commit that sin. Why is that? Is it because of the law? In verse 14 it says, For we know that the law is spiritual. That is, we know that the law is of divine origin, that it comes from God. We know that the law uh, is holy and righteous because it comes from God who is holy and righteous. We know that the law can only do so much because it sets the standards. And when we come up short, when we do not fulfill our duties or our responsibilities, there's nothing in the law that takes care of it once for all time. Yeah, you can sacrifice animals. I mean, I sometimes think that if I was in, you know, I joke and say, man, in the Old Testament, in the old law, I would have rocked because I love following the rules. And I would have had all 613, 613 or so, and I would have just listed them, and I would have followed them over and over again. And then, but I also know I would have probably killed a billion animals sacrificing for the times I came up short. Because, see, the law doesn't provide salvation. The law doesn't save you. So there had to be something new. Now, there will be those who will tell you, well, Jesus abolished the law. Well, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. If you look in Matthew 5, 17, and this isn't up there, but this is the passage where Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Well, he just said right there he's not abolishing it. He says he's fulfilling it. But what does that mean? What does that mean? In the next verse, in verse 18, he says, not the smallest letter or stroke will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. What is accomplished? That Christ comes again? Or that everything in the Old Testament, all of the scriptures and all of the prophecies have been fulfilled? And when were they fulfilled? When were they accomplished? In verse 17 of Matthew chapter 5, that word fulfilled is plerao, which means to carry out that promise, to fulfill the duty, to fulfill that which was expected and told to come. When did that take place? At the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. That's when the old law was put away. We see that in Ephesians chapter 2, 14 through 16. We also see this in the current chapter that we're in, in chapter 7, verses 4 through 6, where Paul is writing and he's equating marriage with the law. He's saying that marriage is created to last forever, a lifetime. But if the husband should die, then the wife is free to marry again. In the same way, if the law is dead, then those who follow the law are now free. And in, in Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6, it says, the law has been put to death, will be put to death. It's, or it was put to death through Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection. He fulfilled that. In fact, Jesus in Luke chapter 24, 44 through 45, says as much. Hey, everything that was written about me, fulfilled. The law is done away with. And we should be thankful. because. But truthfully, there's nothing really... Paul's not saying here in this passage that, man, the law is wrong. The law points out where we come up short. And that's in our behavior. In the fact that we sin. Paul talks over and over again that when you know you look and you see those commandments and the things that he didn't do, and he said, wow, there says, thou shalt, not, this is, thou shalt not covet. And if it says, I shall not covet, then, oh wait, we continue to do that more and more. And we see that there's this ongoing battle in Paul's life. And I think if we're really honest with ourselves this morning, I think that you and I have a struggle sometimes with sin in our life. In the mid-1800s, there was a man by the name of Robert Louis Stevenson. Anybody can tell me what book he wrote? What book did he write? Treasure Island? Yep, Treasure Island. Anybody say the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? 
you guys have maybe not read the book. I encourage you to read the book. It's only 92 pages. It's really not a novel. It's a novella. 92 pages. Uh, maybe take you an hour, 15 minutes, an hour and a half, depending on your reading level, maybe. Uh, but you need to read it, especially the last section where, you know, it's actually Dr. Jekyll writing his letter to Mr. Utterson. But in there, Dr. Jekyll explains what was going on. And he, Lewis, Robert Louis Stevenson, actually was interviewed after. He says, this is the nature of who I am. And if you read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, The Strange Case, you will see Romans chapter 7 in it. Because even some of the phrases, the different natures, and everything like that are pulled right from here. So Dr. Jekyll knew within him that there was the public side that everybody saw, the good side. The esteemed gentleman, the silver hair, well thought of, very respectable, a scientist. Everybody loved him. Everybody respected him. But deep down inside, he knew that there was a darkness inside of him. And he knew that he wasn't just what was on the public, you know, that was showed to the public. He knew that there was this duality of him. And so he decided to see if he could separate the two and create that person who was just pure evil, and then the Dr. Jekyll, who was just pure good. And so he tried different chemicals and different compounds, and he finally created this solution, this mixture, and this potion, and he drank it, and he went through these terrible pains and everything. And when the potion was done, he, he was even physically different. He wasn't, you know, this tall, slender pleasing-looking gentleman. He was hunched over and crouched, and the clothes just kind of hung on him. And when people would see Mr. High, this alter ego, they would look at him, and they knew without a doubt that there was something wrong with him. In fact, person after person said, Mr. Hyde had a deformity. And they're like, what was that deformity? And they couldn't put their finger on it, because it really wasn't something physical. It was just the fact that he was pure evil. And so he would take the potion, turn into Mr. Hyde, take another drink of the potion and turn back into Dr. Jekyll. Well, here's the hard part, is that it started to be well. he would have to take two potions to turn back into Dr. Jekyll, that good person. Because he had given life to this Mr. Hyde, this evil, this darkness inside of him. And it even got to the point where anytime he shut his eyes as Dr. Jekyll, he would start to wake up and transition and be Mr. Hyde because evil was overtaking him. And then he ran out of the compound in the solution. He was getting low, I should say. And so he was sitting there and he was trying to find all of the, the extra chemicals that he originally found. And he then said, you know, as Dr. Jekyll, he says, you know what? I'm not going to give life to Mr. Hyde anymore. No more, Mr. Hyde. And for two months, he kept Mr. Hyde at bay. And then for some primal urge within Dr. Jekyll, he released Mr. Hyde and Mr. Hyde went out and committed murder. And as the story closes to an end, as Dr. Or Mr. Utterson is reading this letter that Dr. Jekyll, Jekyll has penned in his own hand, and this is a short story, Jekyll is understanding that he no longer has control over Mr. Hyde. And so this will be the last opportunity as Dr. Jekyll to tell the story. Because Mr. Hyde is now overtaking him even in, when he's in a wake state. The potions no longer work, and in fact, the potions are ran out. There's evil in Mr. Hyde. In fact, Mr. Hyde was purely evil. And we look at it today, and when we talk about people, we say, well, man, now he's got like that Jekyll and Hyde personality to where maybe they're really good and everything like that, but then something triggers them and they become very angry. And we're like, wow, they're explosive. And we say, well, he's got a Jekyll and Hyde personality. When in reality, don't we all? Isn't there a side of us that we like to hide from the world to where we keep back in the recesses of our mind and our hearts and our behaviors and in the privacy of our own home or even in our car to where there's a dark side of us that we don't want the world to know? 
The scary part is, is when we start allowing that to control us or have more power. Because just like Mr. Hyde started taking over Dr. Jekyll, sin starts to take over us more and more. And as we look at that and we see this and we look at the passage here that we've just read, Paul tells it over and over again. This is what I want to do, but I don't do it. My flesh gives in and it's, not, it's no longer I am doing it, but sin who want, dwells in me. And over and over again, he states that in verses 21 through 23, he's like, this is what I know. This is the principle that I know what I want to do with my mind and my heart, but I don't do it. Felt like that? Ever felt like there's a sin or something in your life that you want to get rid of and you can't do it? Why? Because we look back in Romans chapter 6, I think it's 10 or 11, where we're supposed to be dead to sin but alive to Christ, but all we've really done with the sin in our life is give it a flesh wound and try to defeat that sin on our own. Because Paul, as you read this, it sounds hopeless, doesn't it? Over and over again, he's stating this over and over again. Then in verse 24, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Some scholars believe, as was the, it wasn't a common practice, but a lot of times in Roman culture in the first century, if you were caught and and convicted of a murder, maybe you killed somebody in a public place, what they would do as your punishment is they would take the corpse and you as the convicted murderer and attach you to each other, put you in the public square, often attached with a pole. You were back to the pole, but you were face-to-face with the corpse that you had just killed. And you'd been flogged and beat before that, so you have some open wounds. And then they leave you out there in that hot Mediterranean sun to die in the sun. And while that corpse decays and smells, and the maggots transfer from the dead body to your body, some people say that this is what Paul's referring to when he says, who's going to set me free from this body of death that I am attached to? Is that a wretched man, that live convicted criminal? Yeah, that's a wretched man. And Paul says, that's me. And who's going to set me free? Because I can sit here and say, well, I'm going to write a list down and say, this is what I want to do and this is what I want to do. And then not do it. And Paul talks in Ephesians 6, he says that, and I don't think this, this isn't up there, I forgot to put this in there. In Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18, it's a passage that I think is probably familiar with a lot of you. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 12, it's talking about that spiritual warfare. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the scheme of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And this is what we do with VBS sometimes. And it says, there, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert, be on guard, be ready. With all perseverance and petition for all the saints. That's that spiritual battle that we see and think that takes place in the world, in the heavenly places that Paul writes about. But the battle wages its war inside of you and I. Paul writes in Galatians 5, verse 16, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Do this, and you won't do what you don't want to do. Does that make sense? What you don't want to do so often, you end up doing. If you've ever struggled with a sin in your life, struggled with an addiction of some type, A habit, a bad habit, whether it's language, whether it's what you watch or what you say or just your anger or anything like that, 
You don't want to do it, but yet you do it time and time again. Why? What's the solution? We just saw in, Rome, in Galatians 5, verse 16, that it's in the Spirit. And actually in Romans chapter 8, next, what we get to next week, that is such a wonderful chapter, one of my favorites. And it talks about how that Spirit works in us. And we'll get to that next week. And, and even in our, our verse here, in verse 25 of our text, it's, Paul writes, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the solution is. That's where the answer is. And then at that last part, though, he says, so then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. It's almost as Paul wraps up there, he's conceding defeat. And it would be defeat if he didn't continue to battle. Sin in your life, do not give in to sin. Do not let sin win. It is an ongoing battle. Who's in control of your life this morning? In World War II, in the Battle of Corregidor, uh, General Jonathan Wainwright was the, the, the general that was fighting in the battle and battle, and he knew that he was going to lose this battle. And he knew that if he continued to fight, all of his soldiers whom he loved and had fought with for so long would be killed. And so he surrendered. He says, I felt like I, they did back at Appomattox. And he was chastised, and MacArthur was furious that he surrendered, but he wanted to give his men a chance to live. Now truthfully, truthfully, the prison that they were sent to, this Manchurian prison that he was a prisoner of for three years, was nothing but torture, mocking. He was the ranking you know, officer. He was 60 years old, and so for three years he was beat. His men were beat. They died. They were malnourished. They were beat. They weren't fed. They were fed rice with maggots over and over again until three years later they had this new prisoner come in, this new prisoner of war come in, and he saw General Wainwright and he said, Sir, the victory is over. The victory is ours. The war is over. We have won. They've brought me here. They know it. They're just waiting until release us. And so as General Wainwright went back to his barracks, those same guards who had beaten him for three years started to try to do it again. And he said, no, I'm in control here. We're in control here. Nothing had changed to what he had done. The victory had been provided from someone else. Have you heard that the victory's been won today? The battle for your sin, my struggle, has already been won. It's up to you and I to say the control is not about me. The control is God's and I give Him the victory. Because so often we sit there and we struggle daily, hourly, minute to minute with the sin in our life. And we're like, man, there's this dark side of me. You know, tonight they're talking about this super blood moon lunar eclipse and that, you know, it's going to be this wonderful thing and people have talked about the moon a lot this past week. And I've heard, you know, well, on, you know, we never get to see the dark side of the moon. Well, the moon and earth rotates at a, on the axis at a pretty close rate, so we don't see the opposite side. But on that dark side of the moon, there are fissures, there are chasms, there are scars that rip through that back side of the moon. Now, you don't see it, but it's still there. In the same way in our lives, there's those scars, there's those chasms, there's those dark places that no one sees until it's brought in the light. Look at John chapter 3, verse 19. John 3, 19. Not 16, not 17, but John 19 says, This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men do what? And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were pure evil. Everything they did was evil. There can't be light and darkness in the same place. It's an impossibility. And the moon doesn't create any light of its own. It is merely a reflection of the sun or anything that is shined on it. In the same way in our lives, we allow the world to see the, the good part of us, the face of us. When in reality, a lot of times there's a dark side. 
and we need to shine that light. The light of the world, John 8, chapter 12 says, into our lives. And let's close in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If you say you have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, you lie and do not practice the truth. But, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. All because of the light. Dr. Jekyll, in those last few pen strokes, knew that he needed to figure out a way to end Mr. Hyde. So he took his life. Taking Dr. Jekyll's life took Mr. Hyde's life. Putting to death the sin in our life doesn't end up with everybody dead like some book written you know, 150 years ago. Putting to death sin in our life, the dark side of our life, allows us to walk in a newness of life. It's your choice. Who's in control this morning? The victory's been won. We just get to choose which side we're on. We're victorious not of anything that we've done or any you know, as great and wonderful and sin-free that we are, no, we're saved and victorious despite the sinful man that I am today. Light gives no shadow. It's only when something comes in between the light that a shadow occurs. The shadows in our lives, those little places that maybe it's not a big sin, but it's not a big problem, but maybe it starts as a shadow, it eventually grows to engulf us in darkness. Don't give Satan that foothold. Don't give sin that shadow in your life. Keep shining the light daily. Make the choice to follow Him, to serve Him, and allow that Spirit to guide us to walk in the light. If there's anything we can do for you this morning, please come while we stand.